grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Welcome uh, to the Black Doctor YouTube channel. It is so, uh, it is such a blessing to see you guys again. Uh, we're here for our sort of bi weekly <laughs> stream. We're continuing on with our series on the history of Anglicanism. And uh, what does it mean to be Anglican? We've been going through some really awesome stuff uh, for the past two times that we've had it. We've gone all the way from the beginning of the church uh, and the Celtic church, uh, all the way down to the, the Protestant Reformation, uh, the early Henrician and Edwardian Reformation. And now we've come to a time of, unfortunately, great darkness uh, in relation to the Reformed faith where it was attempted to be stomped out. So we're going to we're going to learn some pretty awesome stuff, some pretty awesome stuff. Uh in order to do so, uh we have our regular gang with us. We have our awesome awesome guests. So uh we have our boy Mikey. What's good, friend? Hello sir, it's so good to see you, Uncle Black Doctor. <laughs> I'm just here to see. I'm trying to convert everybody to let them know that Hinduism prove Islam. Somehow they can appeal to our Vedas and our many gods to prove their one God. It's fantastic. Mashallah, <laughs> mashallah. <laughs> if, you, if you guys don't know uh, what, what Mikey's talking about, uh, he's, been, he's been making some content about some of the craziest things that some of the Muslims are saying. This is these are the links that they're going to have to go to in order to prove their religion, basically saying that the Vedas of the Hindus apparently mention Muhammad and therefore, you know, show Islam. So it, it's it's some of some of the craziest stuff. Uh, but yeah. you've been away uh, for a while, haven't you, brother? Yes, I have, actually. So firstly, um, I had a moment where I realized just almost a week, two weeks into when Good Friday was hitting, that uh, I realized that I didn't take Lent seriously. And the Holy Spirit just kind of gave me a, you know, a slap to my face, kind of like an Asian dad, right? <laughs> and, um, and, you know, I just was like, man, if Christ gave his life for me, I can't give up something that is so even just minuscule in the eyes of eternity, you know? in honor and for love of him right mm -hmm. and so what i did was i was like you know what off social media off discord off TikTok, and i just thought you know what the best thing for me to do was just to try to be alone with god in the moment of just being away and i i gotta tell you when you turn off your notifications on your phone especially from the settings itself you're like wow my notifications tab are, is so clean for the week, you know, and, and you're not constantly distracted. You're not constantly addicted to like, oh, I'm missing out on this or I'm missing out on that. And you're always, you know, you're always like trying to chase what the next best thing is. And then forgetting the fact that you can actually just clear your mind, but to be present with Christ at that moment, you know, so. Oh, my that's goodness, nobody's bothering me. Huh? It's like, oh my goodness, nobody's bothering me. Right. And, and it was like, that never even crossed my mind. I was like, huh. And, and I noticed that I never even grabbed my phone from my pocket because you usually do that when the notifications go off. You're like, oh, one notification, take it out. One notification, take it out. And then I just noticed there was a day where I was like, I haven't taken out my phone for like a good three hours. <laughs> you know? So That's it, was so, it was so beneficial. So yeah, praise God. Well, that's awesome. I'm glad you yeah. I'm glad you had the time to to spend that out to spend the last few days of um of Holy Week and the end of Lent to yeah. to focus on that sort of thing. It's it's mm -hmm. it's brilliant. And now you're in the days of uh of Easter. Um yeah. uh Father Andrew says, you know, we get 40 days of fasting, but now we have 50 days of feasting. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so Yeah, exactly. So we're we're sad for forty days, but we're happy for fifty. So they, it all balances out. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And uh, fifty is Pentecost. So yep. yeah. Yep. And let's. Uh, I I need to I need to be sort of a sort of a 
a stickler and remind him that we still have, you know, the 10 days of Ascension, yeah. <laughs> Ascension Tide in order to figure out those those final 10 days. Um, mm -hmm. But that's just that's just me being a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> we also have our uh, we also have our second uh, treasured guest on here throughout this series. Let's welcome once again Jaden, the Reformed Anglican. Yo, Jaden, what's well, good, my guy? Uh, I mean, can y'all hear me good? Because yes. I said I was yeah. just wondering because typically I would use uh, my AirPod, but that's kind of like at 40 percent, so i'm charging it but i just i haven't used these in a while so i'm just wondering if they sound good but if they're they good, look well. they, they do good they do okay good. so uh how, how how have things been for you man since we last met i mean of course we've had uh we we had our we had our our baptist anglican stream but we also had you know holy week so how's your holy week been uh my holy week has been very good um in fact, for, oh gosh, I'm trying to remember. I'm trying to remember what we did. And yet it was literally like a few weeks ago or last week. Oh gosh, my days are running together. Anyway. This is, <laughs> you sound like a college student. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, it, was, it was good. That's all I remember. Uh, awesome. Well, that's good. I uh, I hope you guys are doing well. Uh, of course, make yourself known in the comments. Um, if you uh, like what I do here, of course, be sure to like the video. Uh, if you want to keep in touch with what I'm doing, of course, uh, subscribe uh, and uh, share. Uh, comment on the video whenever it gets posted so that we can get some more traction. We have uh, we're almost to 2000 subscribers already hey uh, so, i mean it's it's been it's been going well the channel's been doing good mm. so uh i hope you guys uh i hope you guys enjoy what we're doing today so <clears throat> jeremiah jeremiah yes <laughs> to everyone as always soar a 434 that like button <laughs> or we know that you secretly kiss the black stone and drink camel <laughs> yes sir yes sir yes sir <laughs> yeah exactly. So let's let's get let's let's get straight to it. Why why exactly are we here again? Of course, this is part three of our series on Anglican history and doctrine, and uh, I actually figured out a new format that might help. Here we go. <laughs> we actually we're actually able to act. Uh, I'm actually able to focus and see what's on my screen, both here on on uh, on YouTube and on uh, on PowerPoint. So. I, I'm learning. I'm doing better. I'm doing better. Um, so this is episode three of Anglican History and Doctrine, and we're entering, of course, into a time of, of, uh, of darkness. Part one is, of course, the reign of Bloody Mary. And then part two, uh, what we'll do in the next two weeks, uh, is the reign of Queen Elizabeth. Um, in order to do so, I sort of titled this particular series or a particular part of Anglican history, A Tale of Two Queens. Of course, you have uh, the story by Charles Dickens, A Tale of Two Cities, but here it's A Tale of Two Queens <laughs> and Quaxantinople. <laughs> yes. So uh, our uh, speaking of, our boy Sola Soundoff has joined. Uh, he says, submit to England. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Uh, Viva la England. And uh, Xavius said earlier, uh, earlier he said he won't be able to watch live uh, since he'll be at work, but he'll listen to it tomorrow. And I thank you. Um, you're 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 great, friend. Uh, and so let's let's look. So can can somebody remind me of what we went through last session? I know it was like two weeks ago, but see if you can see if you can turn back the clock a little bit, and crank crank that history button back on. What what exactly were we learning about? So if I remember correctly, although I was gone for a while, so I wasn't entirely sure if, you know, you continued the series without me being here. So I wasn't. In, so the only last part that I remember was the, uh, you know, how we were talking about Cranmer mm -hmm. uh, and how he basically you had mentioned that when it came to an annulment, that there were there was a biblical precedent for for an annulment let's say within a, a marriage because it was considered to be let's say for example invalid right um 
So that's the 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 one thing that I remember. Also, the other thing was either it was Cranmer or some other theologian. It might be Cranmer when he was talking. He was in a theological discussion with somebody, namely a Catholic, on faith and works, and mm. the distinctions between uh, the two, and how yeah. the gospel is, you know, especially when it comes to justification, how mm. that is just central. Um, yeah to the life of the believer. It's, you know, not almost like uh, that justification is not seemingly obscured with works. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So what you're, mm -hmm. what you're referring to is what we were looking at a little bit earlier with right. um, Cranmer yes. actually having dialogue with Henry the eighth, because right. Henry was still pretty much, I mean, his, um, uh, his, his theological leanings were sort of contra the Pope but he was still a papist. Mm -hmm. He was still a Roman Catholic. And so the um, Cranmer argued a lot with King Henry, primarily on the issue of justification, because he wanted to make sure that nothing guarded the gospel, nothing shrouded the gospel. Mm -hmm. um, he talks about this in his... Um, in his work on ceremonies. Let me, let me see if I can find a good quotation here. Cause uh, I actually wrote a, um, a paper on this for Kramer's criteria of how to basically write or, or form the form the book of common prayer. And mm -hmm. so he says, uh, particularly in his book on ceremonies, he quotes Augustine. So he says, quote, these ceremonies were grown to such a number that the estate of the of the Christian people was in a worse case concerning mm -hmm. the matter were concerning that matter were the Jews. Such a yoke and a burden should be taken away as time would serve quietly to do it. So what he's saying is that during his time, during his time, the ceremonies of the church were so many they were so clouded mm -hmm. that they that they covered the consciences of the people and clouded the gospel so that you could not see the benefits of Christ mm. you could not produce them and so what he decided and what he writes in his uh, his his introduction on ceremonies is that some of these things needed to be taken away in order that the gospel might be truly shown mm. Mm. so what we're doing so what we're doing is uh, we're going to be looking at uh, particularly going through the history, going through the history and looking at what happened during the reign of, uh, of Bloody Mary. So one of the things that I do want to address, because um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if, if, if Nicodemus understands what we're doing. Um, let's see nicodemus asks uh, how many orthodox were slain by the christian crusades um a lot of them and uh unfortunately that shouldn't have been done uh he also yeah. asked how many catholics were murdered uh on bloody sunday a lot of them and again it shouldn't have happened the loss of christian life even by other christians is wrong yeah absolutely. and so you say christian bashing is not of god indeed but that's not what we're doing. Mm. As you can see, what we're what we've been doing so far is we've been simply telling how history is. We're looking at the history of the English church and we're looking at the moniker that unfortunately Mary, Queen of Scots, earned <laughs> and the people attributed to her that she was Bloody Mary. But we haven't even gotten that far. Right now, we were just talking, taking a recap of of the uh, of of the the previous episode. Of course, the the beginnings of the English Reformation. So again, you talked about uh, Cranmer's discussions with Henry. Um, mm -hmm. and we get to the death of Henry and the beginning of the Edwardian Reformation, where things went completely forward in relation to the Protestant faith. This is where we get the early. Um, the early parts of the, the first book of homilies, we get the ordinal and the book of common prayer. Uh, we get those things done. And the first edition of what would eventually be the 39 articles, the 49 articles end up coming out during this time. Uh, but unfortunately, um, things don't, 
uh, things don't go the way that we always want them to. Uh, because Edward falls sick, he chooses he chooses Miss uh, Lady Jane Grey as a successor. Unfortunately, that doesn't go well. Uh, I could have actually retold uh, Lady Jane Grey's story and titled the this uh, this episode "The Tale of Three Queens," uh, because a lot of people, most of the time, when listing the kings and queens of England, they skip Lady Jane Grey. Sure, she was a queen for only eight days but she was still a queen and she was the Protestant queen before Elizabeth took the throne. And uh, of course we looked at her last words. We looked at her martyrdom. Uh, and this was unfortunately during Mary's reign, the first of many, but we'll get to that in a little bit. We'll get to that in a little bit. So let's look at the reign of Mary Queen of Scots. So during Mary's reign, she attempts to, uh, when she comes to the throne, she attempts to bring England back under communion with Rome. Of course, during the, even the, even the, the king separation from the Pope and the Edwardian Reformation, England wasn't excommunicated from the church. Their communion was broken, but England was still not excommunicated by Rome. And so what Mary does is she seeks to restore that communion, seeks to restore that good pleasure. And so what she does is that she starts a Catholic restoration movement. Uh, one of the people that she places in charge along with alongside her is a cleric named Reginald Pole, or Reginald Poole. Uh, he ends up later on becoming a cardinal during her reign, if I'm not mistaken. And so they they make in ways in order to bring the people of England back into the throes of Rome. If, if I'm not mistaken, if I'm not mistaken, Mary the first was the one who then I don't remember considering she tries to bring back Catholicism to England, whether the Pope made Reginald the Archbishop of Canterbury or whether Mary appoints him as the Archbishop of Canterbury after Cramner when she uh, martyrs him. Probably both. Probably a mix of both. Yeah. Probably a mix of both. And so one of the things that she puts in place is a preaching program. It's a preaching program. And so, um, <laughs> sort of contradictory to what she actually intends, these sort of this sort of program is in English. It's in English, but it's advocating to go back to the use of liturgy in Latin outside of the language of the people. So the program in and of itself is sort of a counter homilies. Of course, you have the rise of the Counter-Reformation for the rest of the continent. So here in England, you have a counter-homilies in order to combat the first edition of the Book of Homilies. So you, you begin to teach about purgatory. You begin to teach about transubstantiation and these particular things that uh, the English church disagreed with, the supremacy of the Pope and things of that nature. And in doing so, Mary and England tries to make an alliance with Spain. And that alliance works because Mary ends up being married to Philip of Spain. So now not only is there a political agreement, but there is a marital agreement. And you would think because the, the, the Spaniards are mainly Roman Catholics that that's going to solidify their, uh, their, their particular perspective in relation to, um, to Rome. Uh, and so, like, this is the state of Mary's reign in the English church. There is a pulling away from the, uh, from the Reformation, the 1552 prayer book, like hardly before it even gets into the hands of the people is immediately banned. You can't use the prayer book anymore <laughs> because it's in English. And so you tried to bring back some of the ancient, some of the, the uh, Roman Catholic rites again. And so, and so England at the time is under the, the, the rule of a Roman monarch. And so you're, everyone is probably thinking, well, great, Mary's here. What the heck are we going to do? <laughs> what happened to the, what happened to the reformers? 
And so you get, uh, you basically get this. A, a lot of stuff actually happens uh, during Queen Mary's reign for the Reformation. So what we see is that Knox, uh, some of the Puritans, and a lot of others in England, they actually flee to German lands. They flee to Frankfurt. And it's there that you have a greater increase in the Puritan and Reform tendencies on the continent. Uh, there, you have debates playing out upon uh, particularly the use of the prayer book. Do we stay with the 1552 prayer book? Like, is it reformed? Or do we keep going? Is reformation still needed in relation to the prayer book? Because if you remember, some of the Puritans, like John Knox and, and, and John Hooper, said that England still needed reform during the Edwardian Reformation. It wasn't reformed enough. There were still some of uh, some Roman Catholic trappings that needed to be taken care of. Um, and so those people during that time disagreed and disagreed. And so Knox ends up leaving Frankfurt and going to Geneva. And there, in going to Geneva, he works with Theodore Beza. He works with Theodore Beza. And there, while he's in Geneva and he's working with Calvin's successor, Theodore Beza, he writes the Geneva Bible. And the Geneva Bible becomes popular later on in Elizabethan England. The Reformation still continues outside of the continent, and then it comes back to the continent. Uh, now, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there really quick because I think we do have uh, uh, – <laughs> Our, our boy Ryan made a made a guest appearance. Our our my dear friend Ryan. He said, uh, "I'm making an ob obligatory Presbyterian troll comment." So, <laughs> uh, blessings to you, brother. Uh, it's good to see you. Uh, and actually, brother Andrew's here too. Um, uh, he says, "Sure, become Anglo Catholic." Um, I'm technically already Anglo Catholic because I'm Anglican and I'm Catholic. <laughs> I, I'm just, I'm just pulling your leg, brother. I'm just pulling your leg. <laughs> so, um, as we, as we continue on, we'll see, uh, as some of the, some of the people who could escape, escaped to the continent, the big leaders and the big reformers during the Reformation, for example, Thomas Cranmer, Hugh Latimer, and Nicholas Ridley were arrested for treason. They were arrested for treason because they blocked the succession of Queen Mary to the throne. I mean, technically you had the king trying to do that too, but that's that's still kind of illegal. That's still kind of illegal, and you, you kind of can't do that. <laughs> uh, but they're also, uh, they're also later on tried uh, for heresy. And the heresy is, of course, you know, not submitting to the Bishop of Rome, not believing in purgatory, not believing in transubstantiation uh, and, and things of that nature. Uh, so any comments before we move forward? Other than uh, what? <laughs> Other than the, the latest comment where it says uh, all we need now is the black doctor uh, with the afro, uh, like in the animation in the thumbnail. <laughs> I wish I could get my hair that big. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't know why, but I mean, hey, give it, give it time, give it time. If I, if I got it that big, I can't wear my scally cap. I'd, I'd lose my, I'd lose my flow, dude. I'd, I'd lose my groove. <laughs> oh man! So any, anything before we move on, because we're, we're gonna get to the. Uh, this might be a little bit short, a little bit of a short episode. It'll probably be like, what, 45 minutes to an hour long. Um, but uh, any any thoughts be, before we continue on? Nice. So let's move to the reaction of Mary's reign during this time. The reign was particularly as long as Edward's was, but there is still a lot of drawback. There was a lot of pushback. Of course, Mary's reign during this time was viewed as unpopular. 
Of course, there were uh, during the Edwardian during the Edwardian reforms, there were still bishops that were convicted uh, of 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 Roman Catholic uh, perspectives. They still had those convictions, but a lot of a lot of them just wanted things to be normal again. They said, this is too much, this is too much change. Can we just go back to normal? And of course, Mary says, yeah, I want to go back to normal, but first we have to burn all these guys. We've got to make sure that it doesn't happen again. And everyone's just tired. Everyone's just tired. It, it makes it even worse because now, because we have uh, uh, the, the political winds in Mary's reign has changed, especially in the empire. The Pope is now anti-Spanish. Now, that's, that's the problem. Because if the Pope is anti-Spanish and you're married to a Spaniard, you're not going to have some very good relations with the Pope right now. <laughs> so at first, at Mary's reign, there was a lot of pol political, um, uh, political advantages, but now it's not a political advantage anymore. She's married to a Spaniard and the Pope doesn't like that. And then not only is it from the top down, but now the people are groaning under the weight of, of Mary's reign. There is now a very anti-Catholic population. A lot of, a lot of people are, are realizing that, you know, this isn't good. This really isn't good. Um, and as they see... They actually make a comment in England that the martyrs' fires burned consistently during Mary's reign. They burned consistently. Now, take, um, take for example, um, King Edward's reign, and let's compare them. Of course, you probably already see it on the screen, but how many Roman Catholics do you think were executed during uh, King Edward's reign? Uh, only 10. Yeah, 10. Very few. I mean, those ten are are, are to be uh, are to be mourned for because the death of any Christian uh, is a is a tragedy. But nevertheless, only ten. Compare that to Mary's reign. Two hundred and ninety eight people were executed, and twenty more didn't even make it there. They died in prison. And so the perception was for a lot of people that Mary killed a lot of people, a lot of people. And so this is where she gets the name Bloody Mary. This is where she gets the name Bloody Mary. And so Wait. at the end of Mary's reign. So Jeremiah, yeah. Jeremiah, so what I'm hearing is. Okay, so what I'm hearing is if you're a Catholic and you do the Bloody Mary challenge, she won't appear. But if you're a Protestant, you'll walk out beheaded or, or burning is what I'm hearing. You'll walk out of that bathroom on fire. <laughs> <laughs> you are terrible. You are absolutely terrible. It, it was What? It's just an idea. <laughs> that, that, that's just worse than my thing of saying, you know, did Jesus have like tea and crumpets in England, you know, but then I'm talking. <laughs> I mean, well, technically, if you if you consider, you know, I mean, the the tale that Joseph of Arimathea and Jesus actually went to England, uh, then maybe they started the trend. They started, yeah. to, uh, not Elizabeth. <laughs> but um, <laughs> that's terrible. Anyway, um, by the end of Mary's reign, by the end of Mary's reign, everyone pretty much was anti-Catholic, and so um. It was actually, as I pointed out a few times before, Mary's reign and trying to bring back Catholicism back to the Church of England actually did more for the Protestant Reformation than the Protestants did during that time. Because, sure, the the point of the point of making the uh, the Reformation during Edward's time was to make Protestantism sound uh, sound good. But it was during the reign of Queen Mary where everybody decided that anything was better than Rome. Anything was better than Rome. And so eventually Mary and Poole eventually pass away and Elizabeth takes the throne. But 
before we get there, before we get to Mary's reign, I do think that we need to hear to spend the rest of our time listening to the voice of the martyrs. Because uh, aside from something like St. Bartholomew's Massacre, England is the only Reformation country that had martyrs, that had full-on martyrs. So um, what do you, some of you guys have read Fox's Book of Martyrs, haven't you? Or at least heard of it. So during the uh, during the Reformation, uh, we've already seen a few of them. Uh, how many how many martyrs do you think um, that you could list off the top of your head that are that that are listed in Fox's Book of Martyrs? I mean, the one that comes to my mind who is very prominent is William Tyndale, because mm-hmm. uh, we know that Tyndale was somebody who had translated the Bible into the English vernacular. Yep, and had suffered persecution and was sadly burned to death. Yep, um, and so I, I think that, which is why, like in my city, we have a place called the uh, you know Tyndale University. It's dedicated to him, right? It's a Bi- it's a Bible college, correct? And so that like th- that's that's definitely one name that comes to my mind for him. Yeah, mm. uh, Jaden, uh, how about you? Um, at least with a number, oh gosh, I want, I've only heard of Fox's Book of Martyrs, but at least from my understanding, list them on your mid, I, I, (laughs) that's crazy. Um, but I would say hundreds at least. Oh yeah, there's there's a lot. I mean, yeah. the Foxy's Book of Martyrs is full. Um, of course, we've we've read a few. Of course, you you pointed out William Tyndale. We've read his testimony. Um, of course, we have Lady Jane Grey. Um, we also have not necessarily the death of Martin Bootser, but during Mary's reign, um, Mary was so upset at the Reformed that she burned the bones of Martin Bootser. Martin Bootser was invited to England and died there. Then Mary dug up his body, dug up his bones and burned them. It's very similar to what happened in the Council of Constance, remember? You know, in the Council of Constance, when um, it's not Jan Hus, um, but the other proto-reformer, um, during the Council of Constance, his body was uh, was was uh, exhumed, burned, and then thrown into the River Swift. And so Mary is basically sort of doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we'll we'll look at some of the voices of the martyrs. Um, Jeremiah, can I? Yeah. So um, Ivan asks uh, a good question. He he asks or Ivan, I, I think yeah. Um, I don't understand why we still say, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church and the creed, um, are still co- are, are still copying Catholic overall. Um, the term, no. the term, the term Catholic, uh, historically, um, never actually went back to Rome. I mean, when Ignatius was, when Ignatius coined the term Catholic or Catholicos, he was not thinking of Rome. Essentially, he was referring to the church overall worldwide or as acts 931 would indicate catholes the ecclesia catholes the church throughout all um and so when we say in the creed i believe in one holy catholic and apostolic church we're establishing that the church was founded on the apostles and that it spread forth from the apostles through succession and that church is one but that church is also, again, throughout all of the world, and that we yes. are part of that one church. Correct. Right. And also, just to just to also mention, too, that uh, St. Ignatius, like, when he mentions in his epistle to the Romans, the presidency, you know, for the church in Rome to have the presidency, what's interesting is that if the supremacy was really that obvious, 
he would have mentioned the name of the bishop there, and he didn't. Yep. And that's well, kind of one thing that needs to be kind of also brought up in the sense that there, you know, when we look at Catholic, we're talking about people who, yes, we all hold to the Nicene Creed. And at the same time, you know, despite, yes, today we have denominational barriers uh, between different Christians. Nevertheless, we are very universal because the spirit of God transcends the very denominational barriers within each believer's hearts. Mm -hmm. And so that's what makes like, you know, Catholic Catholic. Um, so that's how I would answer that. You're exactly right. Uh, I do want to, I do want to put out a, a, a super chat that we got. Uh, the word and I, what's good, brother. Hey, word and I, he says, uh, black dog, salam al messiah. Sup Mikey. Uh, God bless you all brothers in Christ. Thank you so much. Word and I thank you for the super chat. It is a, a blessing to, uh, participate, um, on all of your lives. You're just, you're just absolutely awesome. Uh, uh, so it, it's just, man, I love being on your lives, even though sometimes the people that we generally invite up are incredibly, you know, aggravating. But <laughs> <laughs> we do it not for the sake of them. We do it for the sake of the gospel, yeah. <laughs> for the sake of the gospel, indeed. Um, so let's let's begin with looking at some of the voices of the martyrs. We won't go to the ones that we specific, particularly have on screen yet here. Um, but let's let's read a little bit of, uh, of of some of these. Like for example, um, do you know who the first who the first martyr or the first victim of Mary's persecution was? If not, it's a man named John Rogers. John Rogers who was a clergyman attached to St. Paul's Cathedral. He was burned at the stake in London on February 4th, 1555. When the Lord Chancellor asked Rogers if he believed that the sacrament was the very body and blood of Christ, really and substantially, basically uh, in the words of transubstantiation, his reply was an emphatic no. Quote, for I cannot understand the words really and substantially to signify otherwise than corporally. But corporally, Christ is only in heaven, he said, sealing his fate. For his crime, Rogers was held under house arrest for over half a year, then confined at Newgate Prison for a full year, then the whole, the whole time without any support for himself or his wife, and his 10 children. Finally, when he would not recant, he was burned. And before the end of the year, 75 other men had joined him. Most notably, the two bishops that we're gonna be looking at next. Of course, you already see them on screen, Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley. Now, does anybody um, have any particular idea who these guys are? Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley. Any thoughts? The names sound familiar, but uh, not really. Right. We learned a little bit about them last episode. We learned a little bit about them last episode. And so um, these guys were some of the spearheads of the Reformation. They were convicted by the testimony of, uh, of Thomas Bilney and became spearheads of the Reformation. They worked alongside Thomas Cranmer in order to bring the Reformation to England. And now, through their preaching, um, they're going to pay for it, unfortunately. Unfortunately. But here, let's see. He says, prior to the end of 1553, by the way, the question is, what am I reading? Um, I'm reading the book, Our Anglican Heritage, uh, the second edition by John W. Howell and Sam C. Pascoe. So it's it's a it's a pretty OK book. 
Um, it sort of makes a positive argument for women's ordination. We don't need to worry about that right now. Um, but it also has a counter argument uh, in here by John Rogers, which I highly recommend you read. But that's still not that's not what we're talking about right now. Um, <laughs> Jer Jer Jeremiah, yes. I apologize. I, I, I feel compelled to address this. So Ivan, if we were remove, if we were to remove that we believe in the Holy Catholic Church or in the one Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, if we were to remove that from the creed as though we don't believe it, then we are essentially removing ourselves from the global body of Christ as to say yeah. we are not part of the global body, which yeah. was, is basically us denying our Christianity. So I and, just wanted to say and, that. We just want to make sure, too, the word Catholic doesn't only just simply mean universal. It means whole right it, it means whole in in it's like original even in its original context so the thing is, is like i can understand like for example if like for us as believers and some of like us that are here that are protestants we will say that yes are there certain dogmas or beliefs that rome specifically has that we disagree with sure absolutely but the the point is is that you know, the body of Christ is, you know, Watchman Nee, the Chinese Christian, said it the best. He said, Christ is the head and he is also the body. So mm -hmm. we often say we are the body, but it just imagine turn it around and say he is the body. Right. So the thing is, is that we don't want to divorce ourselves from, you know, the fact that Jesus Christ himself says, this is my body, which has been given unto you. Do this in remembrance of me. Yep. Yes, that is for our salvation. That is for our, like, the blood. That is, like, you know, for our forgiveness. But when he says, this is my body, which has been given unto you, he's literally saying, this is my church, which I have given unto you, which means the family of God, both in heaven and on earth. So we, like, we are not to divorce ourselves from that because this is a, the historic Christian creed from Nicaea which is what every Christian ought to be holding to. Um, and so the thing is, is that this is exactly what we have, you know, this is all that we've held to. I, I can understand that if you have a disagreement with Rome, that's one thing, but that doesn't mean that we could, should just throw out the entire word Catholic, you know, just because we have a certain disagreement with Rome. Yeah. And, and the dis again, like I pointed out in Acts 9 31, the disciple Luke, uh, the physician, the uh, one of the great friends of Paul and, and the other apostles, Luke actually uses two Greek words or actually three Greek words, ecclesia catales, meaning the church throughout all. And then he gives context throughout Galilee and, and Judea and Samaria. So it's about the one church because the Greek is singular, the ecclesia, one church, but it's yeah. throughout all. It's spread out abroad. And likewise, we are part of that Ecclesia Catholic. We're part of the church Catholic because we are a whole that is spread out. Yep. <sighs> so let's see. Where did we where do we put this here? Mm. Yeah. So now that that's now that now that that's taken care of. Um, let's get back to what we were talking about. We were talking about particularly the martyrdom of Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley. I was trying to make sure that I got the right quotes here. Um, and so as we were talking about, these men were, were great men of the Reformation. And unfortunately, their testimony paid the price when it came to the ire of Queen Mary. So it says... Prior to the end of 1553, these two bishops had been confined to the Tower of London, along with Archbishop Cranmer. Remember, they all got arrested. Uh, later, they were transferred to the Bocardo at Oxford, which Bishop Coverdale, the guy who wrote the Coverdale Psalter, which if you use the 2019, it actually uses a modern rendition of the Coverdale Psalter, um, describes as a, quote, stinking and filthy prison for drunkards, whores, and harlots, 
and the vilest sort of people. So it literally says these holy men, Latimer and Ridley, were placed in a place, uh, placed in a home of, uh, uh, where, how, how should I put this? Um, Obi-Wan pretty much described it as a wretched place of vile and scum and villainy. So it's not necessarily a very good place, uh, not a good place at all. And so having inherited leadership in the church, when most of the clergy knew nothing of the Bible, and some could not even repeat the Lord's Prayer, these men had not only helped rediscover the gospel, they revitalized preaching. While Cranmer was the praying catalyst for the English church, Latimer and Ridley were the preaching catalysts for the English church. Latimer in particularly aroused hundreds of listeners to search the scriptures and to know their saving truths. The revival of faith they had helped to lead was also a revival of charity. Ridley, Latimer, and most of the other leaders who perished under Mary set new standards for visiting and caring for the poor, the sick, the widows, the orphans, and those in prison. They were excellent scholars, but they majored in people. That's how a pastor should be. They were known and loved throughout the realm. But when Mary's anger was unleashed against the Reformation, their end came quickly. They were taken to the north side of Oxford and required to listen to a sermon denouncing them and their doctrine. Ridley begged the vice chancellor for an opportunity to reply. He begged them. But here it says, Mr. Ridley, he said, if you will revoke your erroneous opinions, you shall not only have liberty to do so, but also your life. Not otherwise? asked Ridley. No, he was told. If you will not do so, there, there is no remedy. You must suffer for your deserts. Mm. So this is, this is happening on the day that they're martyred on the day of their martyr. But before that, Nicholas and Ridley were locked up, of course, as it said, in the Tower of London, and were often kept separate. They knew for a fact that they were going to die. And so they comforted one another as they were martyred. And as we'll see later, Cranmer is forced to witness it. Let's hear what they say onwards. Well, said Ridley, as long as breath is in my body, I will never deny my Lord Christ and his known truth. God's will be done in me. Then in a loud voice, he said, I commit our cause to Almighty God, who will indifferently judge all. And Latimer added, there is nothing hid, but it shall be opened. And so they were commanded to prepare for the stake. Having already given away all their worldly belongings, they were now stripped to their undergarments and chained to a post. And a bag of gunpowder was tied about each of their necks. And so the, the it, was, it was tied so that you wouldn't necessarily be in so much pain that uh, you'd be tortured for too long. It would light up with the, with the pyre if it, if it reached that height and, uh, you know, blow your head off to make sure that you didn't suffer. So it was sort of a mercy in relation to, this, to the martyrdom of dying at the stake. And so Latimer spoke his final words. Be of good comfort, Mr. Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust shall never be put out. And they did. The pyre was lit and they died. And watching the double burning from his prison window, Archbishop Thomas Cranmer knew his own ordeal was just ahead. Any thoughts before we move on to Cranmer's death? You know, there's a lot to, there seems to be a lot of not like connections or correlations with the deaths of either the reformers or the proto-reformers. Now, of course, the death of any Christian, whether Catholic or Protestant, should be 
like a sin and a stain. You know what I mean? Like it, like anybody who dies in the ha- like under the hands of, um, you know, any Christian that dies under the hands of another Christian, it's just like unconscionable. Right. And the one thing, like like you had said earlier, but it does remind me of Jan Hus because I was reading on Jan Hus's life very something that was very similar, where one of the things that you did see him, even though he was still very like, because of course he was a proto reformer. So he was still very Catholic then, you know, he was still, still very Catholic during his time. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that he had mentioned was that one of the things that he saw was that yes, the bread, when it came to the communion, what was given to the lay people, but the wine was taken by the priest. Right. He wanted the lay people to also have the wine as well too. Both because, Sorry? It's communion yeah. in both kinds. Right. Communion of both kinds. And of course, we do see a development uh, that happened uh, where it was a communion of two kinds throughout most churches, especially even as early as in the early church. But then, of course, it became one kind. Right. Like through and Rome like, acknowledges the- that. Rome, Rome acknowledges that it was the early yeah. practice of the church to have communion in both kinds. But they said, no, we're not doing that anymore. Right. Yeah. It and was if, an accretion. It was and, an accretion. And if, and, if, and if I'm not mistaken, like, I don't mean to jump ahead, but like with regards to because uh, we can see later on, like after the reign of Mary, like this idea of like the priest alone taking the wine, but the the lay people only get the body like that's something that was still occurring even after the reign of Mary. And we see this yeah. because of Matthew Parker in his in his um in his not exposition but sort of um accumulating of the 39 articles he act like article 30 of both kinds where it literally mm-hmm. says that the cup of blessing should not be refused to the lay people correct so yes. we, we even see that i that idea of of only one kind regard regarding yeah. uh the the bread alone being given to the lay people something still occurring even after the reign of mary Right. Exactly. And, and and this is the reason why when I see like people like from the Reformation perspective, these are people that are trying to go back to the original source, namely the scriptures. And the idea that when Jesus himself um, said at the Last Supper, he says he takes the bread. He says, this is my body. He takes the wine and he says, this is my blood. Right. And he's sharing it amongst his disciples, amongst the apostles. Nowhere do you see this idea of, well, Jesus drinks the wine, but the rest of the disciples have the bread. Right. There is this like, so as much as I I might be in the sola scriptura side of things, I, I don't, I'm still trying to figure out like prima scriptura and all that. But the one thing that I will say though, is where else are you going to find the very clear words of Jesus other than the scriptures? And this is what you're finding is that, um, like, I understand that in ecumenical councils, they do quote scripture, but ultimately most of the words of the man himself, Jesus himself is in the scriptures, which is why we give it the proper credence and authority that it deserves. The and so cannot contradict the words of Jesus himself. Right. And so this is the reason why when I think about communion, And I remember when I took communion at this one Anglican church, although it was a low Anglican church, I was elated at not just having the bread. I was elated at having the wine as well, too. And it was just it was such a a, a joy and a beauty because like this is what he holistically put like commanded. Put before, you know, so I can see that, like, you know, with a lot of these martyrs, like what they're trying to do is like. We're trying to hold fast to the very words of Christ himself with that is found in the scriptures, even if it costs us our life. Yeah. And that's what we're seeing with this. Yeah. 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 So uh, now we come to um, we've seen a lot, a multitude of the martyrs where a lot of them are just like what we see in the early church. Where you you don't have a semblance of them shirking back. 
we don't have a semblance of them, you know, saying, well, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know if this is a good idea. They go boldly to death. But we also know some of the powerful testimonies that we have, not only in the early church, but also in the New Testament of people, strong men who at first shrink back, but then go boldly to the calling that they've that they've seen. For example, you guys remember Peter? Yeah. Peter's a guy whom we all love. You know, the rock upon whom the church is built, uh, the prince of the apostles, um, you know, the guy who says, you know, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he starts off bold, bold and brash. Everyone else would probably say belongs in the trash <laughs> because he always put his foot in his mouth. But he 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 stood on business. He really did stand on business um, most of the time until trouble came and he shrunk back the same the same man who said jesus i will die for you that same night three times said i do not know the man and then what happened later christ restored him christ restored him and he went on to be a prominent leader in the church one of the prominent leaders, one of the pillars of the Jewish church, as Paul would say in Galatians. So I think this same example as what we see here in the martyrdom of, of Thomas Cranmer, one of the primary leaders in the English church. Um, for the little time that we have, let's read through his story. So Thomas Cranmer, during his, during his arrest and during his imprisonment in the Tower of London, endured 18 months of psychological torture. 18 months of psychological torture. And so eventually he recants his political, uh, he, uh, he recants his political tyranny and his political um, insurgence against the queen. Because he has a high view of the king. He has a high view of the state. And so that's the first to go. But then later on, he privately recants his theological views. But that's not enough for Queen Mary. He recants it privately like five times out of torture. But that's not enough. That's not enough. Let's hear how he was martyred. In some ways, this one has to be the most difficult of all. Cranmer was the most influential of the reformers and was probably the most sensitive as well. Having begun a loyal Roman Catholic with reservations only on England's political independence, his ideology had become thoroughly reformed. He had even offered to prove in public debate that, quote, all the doctrine and religion set forth by our sovereign Lord King Edward Edward VI is most pure and according to God's word than any other that has been used in England these thousand years, end quote. But Cranmer was also a political creature, and politically, he faced the dilemma. Having broken with Rome out of allegiance to the crown, what was he to do now that the crown had returned to Rome? Cranmer wavered, and finally, after intense pressure, 18 months of psychological torture, he recanted. He recanted. It was a sorry fall, and the news was trumpeted throughout the land, but his persecutors weren't satisfied. They were determined to humiliate the whole Reformation in the person of Thomas Cranmer. They wanted to humiliate him, and they demanded his death. But in their zeal, they sealed their own fate. Having signed several documents of his, of his recantation already, about five, Cranmer was ordered to repudiate the Reformation in public before facing the stake. Why? So that all men may understand that you are a Catholic indeed, they said. 
But Cranmer turned his degradation into glory. Uh, let's see who, who wrote this particular uh, recitation here. Loane in Masters of the Anglo-Reformation recounts it in this way. It says, he began by voicing his sorrow at having embraced so wrong a cause. But his true meaning was hidden. The wrong cause of which he was repenting was not the Reformation, but his denial of it. Archbishop Marcus Lone writes that Cranmer managed his speech with such skill that he was allowed to run on at some length before his real drift was perceived. At length, his true meaning became clear. This is what he says. And now I come to the great thing that troubleth my conscience more than any other thing that I ever said or did in my life. In that, and that is the setting abroad of writings contrary to the truth, which here now I renounce and refuse. And forasmuch as my hand offended in writing contrary to my heart, Therefore, my hand shall first be punished. For if I may come to the fire, it shall first be burned. As for the Pope, I refuse him as Christ's enemy and antichrist, with all his false doctrine. And as for the sacrament, he couldn't go any further. All the pent-up fury of a thunderstruck audience broke out. He was dragged from the stage and hurried toward the stake, but he himself actually set the pace, striding so quickly that the friars accompanying him had to run to keep up. And then, as they tied him and the fires leapt up, he held the offending hand in the flames until it burned to a stump. He said, wow. this hand offended. He looked up into the heavens and he said, I see the heavens opened and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Then as the rest of his body burned without crying or squirming, he simply said, Lord Jesus, Receive my spirit. He I really, was going he, to go to Acts chapter nine. Yes, that Stephen. Story, like I, Stephen, bro. Why is it that like right oh. when you talked about when he was preaching, and then it got to the point where people just got angry and just rushed him to the stake? It remind like the first thing that came to my mind was Acts chapter nine, and oh, sorry, seven, seven, not Acts chapter nine, Acts chapter seven. And Stephen, of course, he was stoned to death. But as he looked up, he saw the heavens open and he saw God, the Father, and Jesus standing at the, at the right hand. And then he says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And right when you said that, like, I'm like, his story reminds me of uh, St. Stephen. Yeah. And you want to you know something funny? Whenever I was looking at it, it was like, because just looking at it, it's like 18 months of psychological torture. First recants his political tyranny privately recants his theological views when forced to recant publicly he confesses his evangelical faith and then you started reading from that book basically like listing out okay like you know like they like something about uh forgive me if if i misquote you or uh misphrase it but like his his actual like his act like what he actually meant and and the first the only thing that i'm thinking about is like what if he's like yes i recant everything that i'm saying you know like that like fingers crossed kind of thing like yes i recant every single thing that i'm saying but uh yeah. i just found that to be funny and then once they finally get up there he's like the pope is antichrist <laughs> <laughs> like you know what? <laughs> Bob the sacrament. Bob, Bob transubstantiation. Forget the Pope. He's mid. Oh my goodness. He couldn't even get to the sacrament. And he's like, and with regard to the sacrament, and they just drug him. Like they, they took him yeah. just like Stephen. Yeah. They, they couldn't handle it. They meant they meant to embarrass him, mm -hmm. but he embarrassed them, bro. Mm. 
he embarrassed them. Yeah. And it's crazy because like uh, um one of one of the things, um oh man, one of the things that's said here in consideration, because I already talked about this a, a little bit. One can hardly remember that sturdy, one can hardly help remembering that sturdy apostle who promised to go with Jesus to the death, but denied him three times before the cock crowed the next day. On the beach one morning after having after the resurrection, Jesus promised that same apostle that by his own death, he would glorify God. Mm. Peter was later to write, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal which comes upon you. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his serve, uh, to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, establish, and strengthen you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Always frail, Mary's own death came on November 17, 1558, of natural causes. She wasn't yet 43 years old. Her hope had been to return England to Roman Catholicism. Her legacy was just the opposite. It was quite certain that the martyrdoms during her reign did more to spread the settlement, uh, the sentiment for reformation than did all the previous governmental efforts. Mm. In trying to stop the reformation, Mary sealed it. He sealed it in martyr's blood. What does Tertullian say? That the blood of the martyr is the seed of the church. The blood of the martyr is the seed of the church. When those go to their deaths proclaiming the reality and truth of the comfortable words, God honors that. God honors that. Because the gospel is worth suffering for. The gospel is worth dying for. Because we serve a God who thought that for the sake of his kingdom, for the sake of his people, for the sake of his son and his spirit, he thought that his elect was worth dying for. He thought that you and I were worth dying for. So what do we make of this? What do we make of this and what it means to be an Anglican? An Anglican is someone who stands upon biblical truth to the point that they're willing to go to the stake. And even when they waver, because a lot of us are too kind for our own good and too sensitive for our own, for our own good, we live in a reality and in a history that tells us that a righteous man falls seven times, but still gets back up. Brothers and sisters, we live in a day and age of theological compromise, and many of us have lived in that, that sense of compromising. Let it not be so anymore. Let it not be so anymore. Stand for the truth of the gospel. Because it is sealed, it is written in the blood of Christ and sealed by the blood of the apostles, prophets, and martyrs. This is our history. Embrace it. Embrace it. Any last comments before we uh, before we end the stream? Other than um, <laughs> bubblegum gun uh, says an erroneous statement that, uh, and I quote, Anglicans are just atheists pretending to believe in God. John Shelby Spong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to uh, say uh, one of the things that you had mentioned about Queen Mary when she had uh, married, uh, you know, the Spanish. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it was the Spanish king, you said, right? Correct. Right. And, uh, and of course, you said that the Pope didn't... What was the reason for the Pope not liking the Spanish, despite the fact that, because I know that obviously Spain 
is pre- even till this day predominantly Catholic. Like, what was was there a particular reason for that? Was that a political reason? Probably either political or familial ties. You know the you know. Okay. I mean, it, it's always a little bit wonky when it comes to politics because, as you saw during Henry's reign, um, right? He the Pope didn't want to didn't want to know the marriage because I mean, the emperor was Spanish, mm. uh, and he's yeah. of course the the I, I believe it was the nephew of uh, of Catherine of Aragon. So right. you didn't want to deal with those political ties. So right. it, there's a lot of politics that goes into these sorts of things. Um, yeah. But eventually that sentiment um, continues on. Um, as we'll see later on, during the later years, especially of mm-hmm. the Elizabethan settlement and later on, there is a mm-hmm. large distrust of the Spanish and there's a large distrust of the French. Mm. Um one of the yeah. things that defined a Protestant during that times is that you were not loyal to Spain and you're not loyal to France because those are Roman right. Catholic countries. Yes. <laughs> so um, they looked at anyone who had Spanish lineage uh, with grave suspicion. Uh, so mm-hmm. there's there's a lot of political things uh, that are meld into uh, theology, but that's the reality of the state church. Right. Yeah. That's just, that's just the reality of, of things how they how they were at the time, uh, for better or for worse. I see. So, yeah, because I was thinking like, it, yeah, it's so weird how Spain being predominantly Catholic, and of course at the same time the Pope not liking the Spanish. You know, I mean, you would think that they would like he he would like them, and then the first thought that came into my mind was like. What were they saying Despacito too much or something? What happened? Like, you know it? Despacito. <laughs> That's terrible, I, bro. I, I, I am so racist. I think I'm the most racist one on this stream. That has got to be. <laughs> I'm sorry. Wow. <laughs> Even BD's like, I am so disappointed. Why do I keep having him on this panel? Like, <laughs> you you inadvertently triggered my impulsive thoughts, bro. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Just oh wow. I, I, we, we were supposed to end the live on a on a good note here. <laughs> But I know to encourage not not abject <laughs> racial <laughs> stereotypes. Oh my goodness! I got to I got to Where? Oh man, and Mick's not helping. <laughs> look at look, look at look at what your fiance put in. I, I told you she's not helping. Okay. Oh. Goodness, y'all are terrible. <laughs> I, 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 I am a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst the people of unclean lips. Wow! <laughs> wow! Shots fired! Oh, oh, you're gonna look at me. You're gonna tell me that I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's, it's like the other me. Why are you booing me? I'm right. I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So anything actually relevant to the conversation <laughs> to, to, to end the, I mean, to end the in, stream. I mean, Jeremiah, in Mikey's defense, it was it was pretty relevant. It was relevant, you know, because it, it had to do with the Pope's hatred for the Spaniards. So am, it, am, it am I going to have to remove you? <laughs> <laughs> Excommunicated. I'm a, I'm a pull. I'm a pull in unlimited power, like I usually do on the word and I stream. <laughs> Any, anyone who annoys me just suddenly disappears. Gone. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! But um, what what do we what do we have for next time? So just next time. We're going to be going through some of the really awesome parts uh, of, of history. Um, really awesome parts of history. We're going through the Elizabethan settlement. Uh, we're going through the Elizabethan settlement. We're going to be looking at, of course, the the rise of Queen Elizabeth. We're going to be meeting, you know, like you said, guys like Matthew Parker. We're going to read. We're going to meet Richard Hooker. We're going to we're going to meet some some really awesome people. We're going to go to the Act of Uniformity. Uh, John Whitgift, John Jewell, um, uh, 
dude, it's it's going to be awesome. And I mean, hey, we might even get into the steward monarchy. Yeah, it's, it's going to be pretty fun. It's going to be pretty fun. Um, and then into the uh, into the Laudian reforms, we're going to be looking at the Caroline Divines, William Laud. It'll be it'll be great. It'll be great. Uh, a history buff will love it. An Anglican buff will love it, too. And I'm sure I will force every single one of you to actually like Anglican history. <laughs> <laughs> we <laughs> welcome it. It's it's more than just the beginning um, of the Edwardian Reformation, but the comfortable words will continue to be expressed, uh, even in the debates of what it means to be an Anglican. Um, how does Calvinism fit into the mix? Uh, the rise of Arminianism and, and things of that nature. It'll be it'll be it'll be fun. Uh, I love it. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Jaden, look at you putting a first Timothy two twelve for, um, for, uh, Jeremiah's fiance there. Wow. Wow. You're wow. really getting now. Wow. Really getting I mean, I mean, wow. I mean, she, li she, li Dear friends, who thou submits to? <laughs> Remember thy leaders. Yeah. Jer this is Jer not a democracy, guys. This is not a democracy. Jer 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 this is not a democracy. This is a dictatorship. He 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 just executed his papal infallibility against me. Um, <laughs> oh, woe is me. <laughs> oh man, I just love that that we can have fun like this. Um, of course. I really, I really needed that, um, but uh, yeah, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be incredibly fun, uh, incredibly fun next episode. Um, I'm gonna try to see if I can keep my schedule. If not, do one a little bit earlier. Um, but we're it's it's crunch time in relation to school, and yeah. crunch time and literally in relation to everything else that I have on my plate. Um, How's the trip coming along? I wanted to ask you, uh, Jeremiah, like the trip to London, like how's that coming along right now? I mean, it's going pretty well. I've, I mean, I've, I've made a good enough money to where I can, uh, I mean, I paid for housing. I'm literally about to pay for flights. So things have been okay. great in that regard. I, I'll mm. probably just need a little bit. Um, if you guys would like, uh, of course, to, to help. Um, we're, we're just making sure that we, uh, that we have more than enough to be comfortable during the trip. Yeah. So, um, let me, let me see if I can, let me see if I can get it up here. Yeah. The word and I was asking about your GoFundMe. He's like, what's your GoFundMe? He wants to, he wants to be able to see it. Oh. Um, I actually, I do have the link actually right here. Let me just post it in the comments. Um, oh, oh, wait, it's not allowed to. Oh, right. Cause I'm not a mod. I can't post it. You are not so. a mod. So I, I got it. I got it. I got it. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. I got it. I got it. I got it. I, but. yeah, I know mod just because I'm Chinese. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, heavens have <laughs> mercy upon me. What, what am I going to do with you? What am I going to do with you? Let me see. Jaden is just dying. How is he a beer? Here we go. So um, here is my GoFundMe. Yes. Uh, of course, I, I have, I mean, we've raised up a good amount of money so far. And of course, the money that I have right now is uh is a lot more than uh what you already see on screen um mm. but <laughs> nope <laughs> that that's my answer to modding you <laughs> <laughs> wow <laughs> i'm kidding um but uh this is the link to the gofundme if you want to support um, my trip to London because me and, uh, and my fiance, um, are going to London at the end of May. 
uh, beginning of June for about two weeks to help in ministry. Um, we're going to be helping a Baptist church uh, going for about two weeks. Um, if you want to help support in that regard, all the information is here on the GoFundMe. Uh, if you want to support, please consider clicking the link and uh, and and donating. Of course, every every little bit helps. Uh, it really does, and I greatly appreciate you. If you if you support my work, if you like to support my work, um, you know this is the way that you can. This is the way that you can. Uh, and so sure. this is the this is the biggest thing that we're doing at the at the moment. Yes, Jaden. So you said you were you were going to help out a Baptist church in London. Yeah. So um, can you at least promise me that you'll give them correct sacramentology? Please. Yes, yeah, I mean, <laughs> dude. Literally, I'm cons like one of the things for our CCMP is that it would be helpful to get our uh, our host a gift. I'm literally just giving him a 1662 international version. <laughs> cuz I mean cuz I mean not just like what the sacraments are but Did also I just who can the receive them? League? I'm 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 done. I'm I'm dumb. How 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 did I, how did I do this? How how in the world did I do this? Um I'm dumb. I mean you're putting the yeah, so the GoFundMe There we go. Yeah. There, there you me. go. Yeah, I, I'm, 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 I'm silly. I'm silly. I'm, I'm moving too quickly. Um, but yeah, here, here's the link below. If you want to support, please consider doing so. Uh, you, you were, you were saying, Mikey. Oh no! Like I, I was just going to say, like, because that's why I was asking about. Because when I looked at your GoFundMe, it said 780, right? And then I was like, man, it's hitting May soon. I'm like, what's uh, you know? You and, got, and of course, you got your oh, stuff. <laughs> I know. It's like I was like, you got your money and everything, like. You know, and so funny enough, like, um, you know, because in May, so you're traveling, hope, you know, by, you know, Lord willing to, to London, I'm heading down to Texas in wow. May. So wow. it'll be my first, first time ever in the US, first time ever. So um, I, I, I promised myself two things. Number one, I'm promising myself Tex-Mex. And number two... I'm promising myself to be able to fire a gun at least once. So, <laughs> that, so that, that's what I'm promising myself right now. You're in I'll the perfect answering. place, brother. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if, if, if there's if there's one thing that Texans probably if there's one thing that we know Texans like sort of hold on to and and have yeah. such reverence and greatness for the most is the Second Amendment. So yeah. yeah. So I'll be in uh, I'll be in San Antonio for the week. So, yeah, uh, but honestly, like I I'll be praying for your trip though, Jeremiah, because I think this is going to be so important you. and um, it's going to be on like, literally it's not just theology. It's literally on the ground experience, you know? Yeah, it's like, and, really, and it's, yeah. I already have like five and a half years of on the ground experience here in the mm -hmm. States. But right. This is this is cross cultural ministry where you're doing yeah. you know, ministry to people who are not necessarily in an assumed Christian context. There's actually a lot of Muslims down in South London, so yes, um, are, are pretty much all over England at the moment. Um, yeah. And so, I mean, this will be a great spot uh, to yeah. to you know take on the Dawa guys. So it'll, yeah. it'll, it'll be fun. It'll be fun. If you guys want to, yeah. if you guys want to support me um, in that regard, please consider, please consider donating. Um, every little bit helps. Every little bit counts. You, you guys mean a lot to me. Um, <laughs> and Ryan says, am I the only one who finds it amusing that Jeremiah is becoming cross-cultural and trans-denominational? <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, I'm glad you put denominational in it because I'm not wearing a wig. Do you wear wigs? <laughs> Have you worn wigs? That my, is a Harry Potter reference. <laughs> my God, this guy caught a whole entire community. Anyway, <laughs> he cooked it was like you home. didn't. <laughs> like you didn't. <laughs> that that is that. In my defense, no, I, I can't defend myself. I can't. You can't defend that. I cannot defend myself. You see, you see, you're honest. You're honest. You can defend it. When Jaden tried to defend it, he got the boot. <laughs> <laughs> 
He literally got Das Boot. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. I'd say I, 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 all I can say is it's because I'm Irish. <laughs> she was nine. <laughs> she was nine. She was nine. And... I remember when I recorded that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's worse than a kind of haggis. <laughs> <laughs> oh heavens oh man oh i'm about to cry it's <laughs> great <laughs> word i said they wax it on the taxes bro oh, <laughs> oh that's great mm. well it's it's almost uh it's almost time so uh i i wanted to thank you both for being here you guys are faithful uh faithful coming into to every episode you guys are awesome i really do appreciate that i hope you're learning i hope you're learning a good bit and appreciating the anglican tradition because this is like all of us are are thinking about joining the anglican communion this is our history yeah. this is our history this is our heritage aside from the entirety of the christian heritage which is of course our heritage because we're we're christians first and anglican second but this yeah. is our this is our particular heritage that we have, and, and especially as English speakers, this is our heritage. This is what went on in order for us to get an English Bible and have it stay in an English Bible. Like what we just went through is what our predecessors had to had to go through in order to get the Bible in English and mm -hmm. have it stay in English and not simply be lost to the sands yeah. of time. Yeah. Amen. But yeah, um, uh, thank you guys for joining. This was absolutely awesome. Thank you guys. I think we had like 15 people watching, 15, 16 people, which was great, honestly, for a, for a history episode, because generally a lot of people think history is boring. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I hope you guys like it. If you guys are watching this uh, afterwards, uh, of course, please, uh, please like, comment and subscribe. Uh, we really do appreciate uh, all of that. It gets the algorithm up and helps it uh, helps it get reached out to other people. So a lot of people can learn these things. Um, so uh, I really do appreciate each and every one of you. Uh, if you want to help support me, of course, uh, check out all of my links. They are in the description below. I appreciate each and every one of you. Uh, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. God bless God you bless. guys.